Today's lecture, uh, this is going to be a brief lecture, I just want to look at a few of the factors uh, concerning both the British and the Americans at the very start of the American Revolution. You know, just to sort of restate something I, 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 I talked about in the last lecture, it's important to understand that the American Revolution is both a rebellion by one third of the population initially against the British Empire, and it's also a civil war fought between two-thirds of the colonial population with the patriots on one side and the loyalists or, or the Tories on the other supporting the British. And, you know, most of the fighting, the civil war component of the revolution is really important because most of the fighting will actually occur between patriots and loyalists, right? There's a real kind of a grassroots community on community uh, violent component to the American Revolution, right, that is sometimes lost in the larger discussion of, you know, the efforts of the Continental Army against uh, the forces of, of British imperialism, right, so we have to keep that idea in mind. And, you know, this is not surprising because, you know, the actual effort of the Patriots, right, was never to engage uh, the British Army in direct, you know, long-term military confrontation, right? They, they, they didn't want this aggressive head-to-head -head struggle. Instead, as I talked about in the last lecture, from the beginning, the, the, the goal was to wear them down, right? To just keep at the battle until the British forces lost both the political will and political support, both in the colonies and back in England, right? It's that kind of that long-term war of attrition view of the American Revolution. So before we start, I, I, a couple ideas I want you to have. So who are the loyalists? Like who are these loyalists? We know the names of most of the great you know, American patriot leaders and we have some sense about who they might be, but who are the loyalists? And why are there so many of them, right? One of the reasons is this, is you know, in a previous lecture we talked about immigration and the social structure of the colonies before the 1760s, mostly. <clears throat> well, between 1763 and 1776, you know, close to 125, 130,000 people migrate directly from England to the colonies. Okay, so that's after 1763, directly from England. And the reason for this uptick in English immigration uh, is not surprising. You know, 1763, ends the Seven Years' War, it ends the French and Indian War, which is the same war, right? And, and the British are the complete masters of North America, right? The French are driven out. And basically, it becomes a time for people, you know, of optimism. It's time to come to the New World, this, this, you know, this, this secured British holding. And overwhelmingly, these recent immigrants, these recent immigrants <coughs> will be loyalists. Uh, they'll be ardent loyalists, you know, because they didn't have that 150-year colonial experience, right, that, that created those colonial dichotomies and, and found their representation and their expression in the colonial legislatures. They are recently from England, right? So a large number of the loyalists will be these recent immigrants. And, in fact, where we see their numbers go, uh, South Carolina and Georgia, and a fair number go to uh, New Jersey and New York, those areas will actually be loyalist strongholds for most of the revolution, right? So you can really trace this out. And there were just other uh, people already living in the colonies who had loyalty to England, right? Or some of them, they weren't necessarily loyal to England, but they just didn't feel that the rebels would ultimately represent what they wanted from England, right? So, the, you know, those are the loyalist core. There's a couple other groups that join the Loyalist Corps that are very much worth talking about. You know, two of the groups are uh, African Americans, black African Americans, and uh, Native Americans will both overwhelmingly support uh, the Loyalist British cause. And I should say not all. There are absolutely slaves and ex-slaves 
uh, and, and, and free black citizens of the colonies who will support and join with the patriots, as there are Native American groups that actually will, in much smaller number, also support the patriots. But overwhelmingly, the numbers of, of African Americans and Native Americans uh, will support the British. And there's a couple of very key reasons for this. You know, in the case of the African Americans, you know, the British uh, actually do make one fairly savvy uh, strategic decision excuse me, at the beginning of the revolution, is that they look for who are the likely you know, uh, demographic groups of support. And one of the people they were pretty sure was going to support them were slaves, right? Africans were not complicit in their own slavery, were eager to not be slaves, resisted in many different ways. And what the British knew this, and what they said was, they said, listen, any slave who joins the uh, British cause and is willing to fight on the side of the British and support their military efforts uh, will be granted their freedom, right? So they exchanged freedom for actual military support from African slaves. And this, especially when the British came rolling through an area that had uh, large amounts of slavery, they would liberate slaves, or slaves would liberate themselves and join up with the British. And, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's uh, some famous cases of this. You know, Lord Dunmore. Lord Dunmore is uh, the colonial governor of Virginia. And in order to fight the patriot insurgency in Virginia early on, he creates a, a, an ex-slave army. He enlists something close to a thousand slaves and arms them and trains them into a pretty effective fighting force in Virginia. Uh, over the course of the war, some 20,000 uh, Africans will in one way or another participate in the British effort. We're going to talk about in a, uh, at a later lecture the fate of those who, who joined with the British because it is actually a, a very interesting and, and globally important history. But for now, uh, it's worth it to know some 20,000 uh, African Americans, you know, liberated themselves and made a conscious decision to join and support the British cause during the revolution. The other group that will overwhelmingly support the British are the Native Americans, okay? And uh, the reasons for this are very self-interested. You know, the relations with the British hinged on the successful fur trade, okay? The fur trade, particularly around the Great Lakes region, and uh, interior of eastern Canada, the fur trade was, was very important to the British. And as a matter of fact, the British had already tried to impose certain laws to restrict colonial expansion into those areas, into the Ohio River valleys, uh, because they didn't want this, their, their land grabbing to upset the fur trade. And, you know, the Indians were never, Native Americans are never uh, equal partners in any of these dealings with the Europeans, yet they were able to maintain a high degree of autonomy and get access to European goods and weaponry and maintain this sort of middle ground, right? This middle ground between their way of life and, and hunting and European global markets without being completely dominated. They got to live there. But the truth is, with the colonists and with the Americans, there is no middle ground because the Americans, you know what they want? They don't want the fur trade they want the ground itself. And when the ground itself, and I mean literally, not a metaphorical middle ground, the actual ground, the land of the Ohio River Valley is the most fertile land, you know, uh, this side of California, right? And the colonists know that. They're already settling into it. And, and this thirst for farmable land is, of course, in many ways what drives the revolution. And the colonists want the very land the Native Americans live on themselves. There can be no middle ground. The Native Americans felt uh, almost wholly there had no future with the Americans, right? And the sad truth of American history is what they thought was correct, right? What they, their suspicions were correct. Their future was severely compromised with American success. So uh, the Native Americans of that region all throw in 100% um, <clears throat> eventually the Iroquois are the ones who hesitate and still lose anyway. So, but overwhelmingly, the Native Americans of the area will throw in with the British, knowing that the only future they really had was with British success, and that American success uh, was just bad for their long-term prospects. 
another group, and we don't think of these as loyalists or even part of the colonies, but you know, there's another British North American colony we almost never talk about, and that's Canada. You know, the differences between the colonies, you know, in, in 1750, that New York and Pennsylvania were no closer to one another culturally and politically than, you know, New York and Nova Scotia, right? That there's actually, they were all just the British North American colonies. And very early on, um, the American patriots felt that there was a good chance that there was strong support and anti-British sentiment in the colony of Canada, right, up in, up in British Canada. They, they really suspected that the French Canadians would resent the British and would join the patriot cause. And as a matter of fact, the first military actions of the revolution is an invasion of Canada, right? They actually invade Canada very early on. And the, the patriot generals are absolutely certain that the Canadian populace will join them in ousting the British. And it turns out they were 100% wrong. That, in fact, uh, the, the French Canadians and the, and the Canadian population in general overwhelmingly rise up as a militia and assist the British in driving out these American forces, right? It ends up being uh, a disaster for the early Patriot forces. And in fact, from that point on, you know, Canada will remain firmly not American, right? They're not part of the American Revolution. They remain part of the British Empire until well into the 20th century when they finally, you know, become established as an independent country, right? So this is, uh, you know, very, very uh, specific, right, that, that this happens, that there's loyalists didn't just refer to people in what we think of as the 13 colonies and what becomes, you know, the first 14 states, but there's loyalists in Canada as well, and, and the activity among these uh, unlikely loyalists, the French Canadians, you know, enables British success there for the long term, as a matter of fact. You know, and finally, I should say that uh, the British will ultimately get about 21,000 uh, white colonial loyalists will join the British Army or act as a, as a militia to fight alongside uh, the British regular forces during the Revolution. Which brings me to, I just want to do a quick sort of summation of sort of the advantages uh, each side had at the beginning of the war. Pretty straightforward here. You know, the British have one huge advantage. They are far larger, you know, and more economically sophisticated with a larger manufacturing base than the colonies, right? There's almost 12 million people living in England at the time. There's only about 2.5 million people living in the colonies. And only one third of those are patriots, right? The other two thirds of those are either loyalists or neutrals. England has the world's largest navy, the most sophisticated navy and the most powerful navy. They have an incredibly large, professionally trained, well-armed, deadly standing army, right? The British regular forces are incredible at fighting. They are wonderfully disciplined. They are, they are almost fearless. They are effective. You know, and there's, there's this old mythology about how foolish they were to march in straight red lines and the Americans hid behind trees and shot them and that's how we won the war. And that, of course, is, I mean, that's, that's just wrong, right? That the British forces are actually so disciplined that, they, that again, they, they overrun the continental forces almost every time they engage each other early on in the war. Their professionalism, uh, their, their access to better weaponry, early on has immense, immense, immense um, advantages. You know, and this British Navy, I mean, almost immediately establishes a blockade, a fairly effective for a long period of time, blockade of the colonial world, which is another um, uh, advantage of Britain, is that they had access to the global, to global markets, right? They had their own manufacturing, they had other colonies in other parts of the world. The colonies get cut off, right? They are kind of isolated from everywhere else. They can only rely on what we have here. And we didn't have a very large manufacturing base, you know. I mean, supplies and maintaining a well-armed and well-supplied continental force will be one of the great challenges of the American Revolution. You know, the British will start out with about 48,000 soldiers, professional soldiers, stationed in America. Uh, they will expand to as large as about 110,000 professional British soldiers are committed to the American Revolution. They will be aided by 30,000 um, Hessians, Hessian mercenaries. Hessians was a state in Germany. 
Uh, and they do. They're mercenaries. They're our paid soldiers. You know, as we know, Europe, Europe had gone through 200 years of intensive nation-state warfare, and uh, you know, the job occupation of mercenary is a fairly widespread one. And so we have these mercenary forces, these auxiliaries who were brought in, uh, often to be used as a police force so the British Army could move around. Uh, but there's, there's, there's a significant number, about 30,000 of them. They're professional soldiers. They will have 21,000 loyalists on their side, a large number of African American and Native American uh, militants also join their force. So early on, the British have a lot of advantages. The Americans, of course, the American patriots, have some important advantages early on as well. You know, and the first and the foremost is, of course, it's home turf, right? They're defending their home turf. They had places they could go to resupply themselves. They had indigenous support. They know the land, right? This sort of thing is, you know, in your, when you're defending your home, it changes the face of war, your commitment to war. So the, there's, the, there's kind of the home turf advantage that really can't be ignored. The British are, for better or for worse, even though it's their colonies, they're the invading force, right? They're the foreigners. And ultimately, uh, the Americans will be able to enlist uh, a very large number of people into the Continental Army. You know, by the end of of the Revolutionary War, you know, some 220,000 men between the ages of 16 and 45 will have been enlisted or served at some point in time in the Continental Army. And that's significant. And of course, the story of how they get there is, is really, really important. That's a subject of the, of the next lecture. Another part, and this actually comes under conventional warfare in many ways, of uh, the American war effort that is often underrated and in fact is probably from a straightforward strategic standpoint the most successful and important part of the American war effort is the American Navy. Now at the start of the war there is no American Navy. Okay, However, there's a couple of things the Americans have. We have the largest merchant marine on, in the world. Right? The colonists is the home where one out of every three ships you know, transporting goods throughout the British Empire is made in America. And they very quickly use our natural resources, something that England loses, particular timber, right, to retrofit uh, this merchant marine and turn them into fast attack, uh, smaller naval ships. And the second thing that goes with this, it's, it's one thing to have the ships, but you know what the Americans were? Wonderful sailors. We're wonderful sailors who know our own coastline in inlets and bays better than anyone. And uh, one of the most successful parts of our military campaign will be the constant harassing and uh, attacking of the British naval ships and, 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 and the British blockade. You know, by the, the, the end of the war, you know, American, the small American Navy had captured some 2,000 British vessels, had... Uh, We'll, we'll capture about uh, almost 17,000 British sailors, right? This is actually a very, very effective part of the war. It's, it's something that's overlooked. One, we had a merchant marine that could be quickly converted into military use. We had the raw materials and the access and the know-how in order to do that. And we're great sailors, which is an important, important very important, because this comes up. So there are, there are countries that can build great navies, but they're not great sailors and, and in other points in history that that comes out that actually having skills as seamen goes a long long way of course another big thing for the Patriots and this is always important they had something to fight for right ideology which of course ebbs and flows how passionately people hold that during the course of the American Revolution which is a long period of time it goes up and down but in the end, this initial ideology creates a rage and a willingness ready to rise up and fight against the British. And in the end, that ideology is still there. It, is, it gives them a, a central rallying point, right? the ideology of, of egalitarianism and democracy and liberty. It's very much a part of this revolution, right? And the level to which it is passionately felt and it motivates the population, does go up and down. It starts very high, it drops to a low point, but through some really good political and strategic work on, on behalf of the Patriots, by the end it rises back up again. 
You can never underestimate uh, the value of a motivational, cohesive ideology to a resistance movement, to an insurgency, a rebellion. And you know, England, of course, had the great disadvantage of the war taking a long time. That when the initial victories in battle, and the quick conquest of New York and Philadelphia and New Jersey, right? When those quick victories didn't yield victory in the overall war, that the war just kept grinding on and on and on. You know, the English had to fight, again, as part of that triangularity of war, that, that other part of this sort of asymmetrical war, is they started to lose the will at home, right? Where the British citizens, the tax-paying British citizens, began to lose their willingness to, to, to pay heavier and heavier taxes and incur greater and greater debt in order to sustain this war effort, which was starting to look fruitless. And in the end, I mean, that kind of is the story of the American Revolution. And so I just wanted to give us a point, of, a point to start the, the historical discussion and investigation of the American Revolution by looking at who the loyalists are, what each side has going for it at the very start of the war, and really what's at stake over the course of the war. That's all we have for today. Thank you.